you. Let's open God's Word together again and turn to the New Testament book of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And this day always has a lot of mixed emotions. Uh, Eli, come on in, buddy, and have a seat. Thank you. Plenty of chairs around. Here's one right here if you're having a hard time. Thank you. This day, Father's Day, often has, carries many mixed emotions. And it does that often depending upon the kind of a father you grew up with. And sometimes if perhaps your father wasn't what he ought to have been, then father, Father's Day brings a bit of bitterness, a bit of pain to remembrance. Some have been raised with very loving and caring fathers. And that brings a smile when you think of Father's Day. It's also challenging because there are some people who would love to have children and were not enabled to have children. And that can be challenging. And so I want to speak mostly today about our Heavenly Father, God. And He is the pattern that every earthly father can follow. I love Luke chapter 11 for a number of reasons, but I love it because it it really deals much. Jesus is trying his, he is laboring to help the disciples understand what the Christian life is all about. And the more we study the words and teachings of Jesus Christ, the more we begin to understand how we ought to live, uh, the more we understand who God is. I worry sometimes that we're just not careful with the words that come out of our mouth. I worry sometimes that if we're not careful, we'll say things that thinking we know something about God, thinking we're being theologically clever, and in so doing, we oftentimes are misrepresenting God, all for the sake of being, in our opinion, theologically correct. I do not want to stand before God one day thinking I was theologically correct, but totally missed the character of God. I think about the story of when Jesus told of the, twice he gave two different stories of how he gave to servants talents. Then he went away. And he entrusted unto them a measure of his own, a measure of his substance to which they were to invest. You know the story. On one occasion, one man invested and got back tenfold. One man invested and got back fivefold. And another man invested and took the one talent that he had given and he hid it. And the reason he hid it was because he knew in his mind that God was an austere, that his master was an austere, hard master. The problem was he didn't know his master at all. He did not know his master. And I'm afraid sometimes by the words that come out of believers' mouths, By the things that they say, they don't really know God. Or they'd never let some of the things that come out of their mouth. I'd rather stand before God one day and be guilty of thinking too highly and broadly and widely of his character than to narrow his character down so much. I'd rather stand before God one day and be guilty of thinking God was far more gracious, merciful, loving than to stand before him and be accused of thinking he was far less, because I lived my life thinking he was far less loving and merciful and gracious. God forbid. And Jesus is trying to teach his disciples something about God. And it begins, they say to him, it came to pass as he was praying, he was praying in a certain place, that when he ceased, I'll just say again, An old preacher, Leonard Ravenhill, one time said, you can learn a lot about somebody by listening to them pray. When they heard him pray, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. You and I will never get any further in our Christian life until we admit we have further to go. We will never grow any more in this Christian walk in life until we acknowledge we got a long way to go. Pride is a destroyer of the faith. Arrogance is a murderer of faith. And may God remove it from us. Teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. 
And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our Father. Now, I love this. You've heard me talk about this before. Jesus instructing his disciples. Now, he gives three sections in what we've read a moment ago in the first 13 verses of this chapter. Three different sections and different explanations about our interaction with God. And the first one is really an instruction manual on how to pray. And I believe he's speaking very, very plainly to them that they have access One of the privileges of being a child is that you have access to your parents like other children don't. And although most, if you have children and and another child who doesn't belong to you comes and he asks you for something, or normally because of our, our compassion towards our own children, we understand then we'll be compassionate towards these as well. But when your own child comes to you, your own child has access to you like no other child does. And when you've been born again, when you've come to know the grace of God, your sins have been washed away, I believe that Jesus is teaching his disciples very plainly, very clearly, from the beginning of this instruction manual of prayer, that one of the first things to consider is that God is our Father. Before you and I start praying and giving our big list of things, sometimes it almost feels like a hopeless cause to pray. And Jesus says the first two words out of your mouth, our father. God is a father. Now, I remember I, I've, I've oftentimes had a hard time imagining God to be a father. And sometimes if you're not careful, if you don't know God, then you'll have a hard time looking at God as a father. I know some Christians who say they've been born again and they do not view God as a father. They still view him as a judge. They call themselves a Christian. They say they've been born again, but they still are frightened to death. That God's going to jump out of the sky with a big rod and whack them across the ear. Now, some of that may be because their father was a bit like that. Their earthly father. But Jesus is encouraging us to say that our God is no longer just a judge towards us. He is our father. And just in case you maybe misunderstand what a father or what God the Father, uh, what his role is, there are several scriptures. We read the one in Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 103 when we first opened the meeting. But I love those words. Those are words that I've marked in my Bible. They'd be worth marking in yours. He says that the, the context of Psalm 103, verse 10, he has not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Boy, I can remember sometimes I upset my parents so much that they couldn't wait to give me what I deserved, if you know what I mean. Are you listening? I can remember sometimes growing up when I had disobeyed or did something that I shouldn't have, and my parents were very quick and ready to give me what I deserved. But our Father, the Bible says, He has not dealt with us after our sins. So we have a hard time sometimes imagining God as Father because we have an earthly view of a Father. But the Heavenly Father is different. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. We find His love We find his mercy. Now, I want you to just understand, this is not towards everyone. It's got to be those, as a qualification, those that fear him, those that know him. Remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, that the whole duty of man was to fear God and keep his commandments. That simply means you know him. You know who he is. You acknowledge who he is. You have reverence for him. And when you acknowledge him for who he is, great creator God, what he could do, how he could snap his fingers, breathe on us, and make us shrivel up like a raisin. You know, when you begin to understand what he could do, but what yet he hasn't done. When you begin to understand what we deserve that we haven't gotten. Sometimes my wife and I say about our children, we'll say, these children just are not grateful. But do you know sometimes we as adults are just not grateful? We're ungrateful. God was speaking to 
the nation of Israel in the book of Malachi, and he said something very interesting. I came across it uh, late last night before I went to bed, something that just stuck in my head. He says in, in the very first chapter of Malachi, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord. I have loved you, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Now you think what ingratitude that God says, I have loved you, and you've turned your back on me. You've rejected me. You worship false gods. And you say, how did you love me? The majority of humanity say the same thing. They don't appreciate or recognize the love of God. Psalm 103, we were reading in a moment ago, speaking about his, his, uh, he hasn't dealt with us according to our sins. His mercy is great towards us. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. His pity towards us. Now, I, I, I hope a natural father, a proper father, pities his children. My wife will tell you, tell you this, but one of the worst things that could ever happen in my day is for one of my children to be hurt because I don't really know what to do. If I can't fix it, I really have a hard time with that. I'm a very practically minded person, a very practical man, and so, you know, if a light bulb's out, I can fix that. If the door comes off the hinges, I can fix that. If the bathroom needs tiling, I can fix that. If we run out of coffee, I can fix that. But if a child's crying and I can't fix it, that really bothers me. And that same kind of pity and anguish and distress, you can imagine that God, who is love, can I just say you cannot separate love from the character of God. Everything he does is in love. Everything. Because it's part of his character. Even the chastisement, even judgment, love. And if God being such a God, if we being broken can look at our children and pity and distress, how much more does the Lord pity us? Pities us when we are in our sins. He pities us when we're in our own mess. Scriptures, one of the prophets wrote about how he, how he was in his own blood and God came along and pitied him and said, live. Dying in our, own, in our own desecration, and he pities us. Romans chapter 1, uh, one thing I love about the New Testament letters, if you'll, you'll notice one thing, is that almost every New Testament letter begins with a greeting from God the Father. Those words. Romans chapter 1, verse number 7, To all that be in Rome, be loved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father Hallelujah. and the Lord Jesus Christ. You find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1. A greeting from God our Father. And Paul wants every church, every New Testament believer to know that God is your father. So every letter is written with this in mind because he also knew that we would be constantly failing and then when we fail, when we sin and mess up, there'd be this constant fear. Ooh, uh, the God, the, God the judge is after me again. Now we ought to walk circumspectly and carefully. When we sin, it ought to grieve us. We shouldn't be frightened that we've lost our sonship. I love that thought. No matter what my boys do to aggravate me and frustrate me, they don't do much, of course. I can never unsun them. I'm stuck with them and they're stuck with me. They're my children. And so it is with God. We belong to him. 
Romans chapter 8, a beautiful chapter. Verse 15 says, you have not, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You were set free from that. You used to be in bondage to fear. Not anymore. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again. You used to have it again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We traded in the spirit of bondage to fear. We traded that in for the spirit of adoption to love. We traded. We used to be afraid. Now we rejoice that we belong to him. We've been adopted. Can you imagine a child who sat in an orphanage all his life and Someone comes along, someone very loving and compassionate and caring comes along and says, I want him. Can you imagine the feeling of a child? Their whole life being rejected, their whole life afraid that they're never ever going to have a family every year that goes by, a fatherless, motherless every year that goes by, not, not having the love of a father or a mother and afraid that they're never ever going to have it and, and afraid they're going to become an adult before, before they ever even experience the, the love that a child should experience. And here comes the most loving husband and wife to adopt these, this little child. Can you imagine the feeling? That's what's happened to you and I. We've been adopted. We were alone. Slaves to bondage of fear and sin, but we've been adopted. God in his mercy came and took us. Amazing. He pities us. He also corrects us. Do you know that correction is a good thing? We're living in a society that thinks it's not. We're living in a society that thinks that you should never ever correct a child. You should never tell a child that they're wrong. You should never tell a child no. You should never ever correct them. You know, you should only give positive words of reinforcement and courage and encouragement, but you should never ever tell them that they're wrong. And that's what's wrong with our society. Nobody's wrong anymore, except Christians. We're wrong, but uh, nobody else is. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 12 uh, says, verse 11 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. If I love my children, if I delight in my children, then I will correct them because I love them. If I understand that the way that they're going is a bad way, they're heading in the wrong direction, then I am not a good father if I let them continue. I am not a good father if I don't say to them, You should not lie. It is wrong to steal. It is wrong for you to go up and kick another child. I get so annoyed sometimes. Now, I know my children can be just as guilty. Sometimes people just imagine, well, if the child, you know, it's okay. If the child hurts another child, it must be somebody else's fault. No, it's wrong. They're going to grow up hurting everybody they meet because they were taught by you, father and mother, that it's okay. They were never corrected. And there are some mothers, uh, and some mothers think their children can never do any wrong. Now, I know my children have some issues that need to be dealt with. But there are some parents who think their children are never in the wrong. You are creating a monster. I'm sorry. If you don't acknowledge that your child has a sin nature, and if you don't correct your children, you are creating a monster. And who knows what that little monster is going to do when it grows up one day. My father grew up in a home where his mother, my grandmother, uh, that she imagined that her boys could never do any wrong. She had five sons. Her boys could never do any wrong. I think all of them apart from one spent some sort of prison time, prison sentence. And I'm sure it wasn't their fault. But our God loves us, and because he loves us, he corrects us. Praise God. I thank God when I feel the... Uh, the chastening hand of God. Because that tells me I belong to him. I'm his child. If there's no correction in your life, then something's wrong. In Luke chapter 11, we have access to him. I love this. We have access to his ear. 
Do you know that? I mean, of all these children in this church, I love every one of them. But my own children have my ear more than the others do. They belong to me. You have access to the ear of God. You have access to the house of God. Do you know that? Uh, if, if a child comes to visit my house and they don't belong to me, they knock at the door. Well, most do anyways. But if, if it's my child, they're not going to knock at the door. Why knock at the door? This is my father's house. What access, what liberty, what freedom. We can go into the very throne room of God with great liberty and freedom and boldness because we are his children. We have access to God. Wherefore, then we come boldly to the throne of grace because we are his children. But he gives us another little parable there. If you, if you remember in this parable, verse 5 to 8, the parable of the importune man, I believe what Jesus is showing us, number one, is not just to give up when you pray, but also showing us another element of our relationship with him is he's not only just father, he's also friend. Yeah. That's what it says. He's, the illustration is of, of a man who doesn't have what he needs, so he goes to his friend at night, who is God the Father. Now, I love this. Now, uh, every once in a while, a father makes a mistake when growing up. He, he wants so much to be his child's friend that he neglects the fatherhood. And that's a danger. That's a danger. You want to be best mates, and so you go out drinking together, and you want to be best mates, and so you get to do this. And you, you forget that you're a father. You're supposed to be setting an example, a role model. But here's God who doesn't have to forfeit his fatherhood, forfeit his fatherhood whilst being our friend as well. The Bible says there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That is God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Abraham was called the friend of God. It's not blasphemy to be God's friend. It's a privilege and a right of belonging to him. Jesus said in John chapter 5, very encouraging, John 15, pardon me. He says this, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. We are his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I have commanded you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. There's an intimacy that we have that we can have with Christ that I think most of us have forfeited. There's a nearness and intimacy with the Lord Jesus that most of us have never entered into. We are his friend. And he didn't hide anything from us. He's given us his word. He's given us the Father's word. Whatever the Father's told him, he's told us. What intimacy, what relationship. And then the last few verses, verses 9 to 13, I believe, he also tells us we have reason as, as the children of God to have expectation. I love this thought. He's our Father. We have access to him, and, and uh, we, we, we are his friends. But we also can expect, the Bible says from verse 9 down, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall, shall be opened. Shall be given, shall find, shall be opened. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. We have expectation. I think we've lost that in our praying and in our Christian life. We don't expect God to hear our prayers anymore. We don't expect God to be involved in anything we do. We've lost that. That's why we think so naturally. That's why we say things like, like uh, is that really going to work? Well, that's pragmatic thinking. We don't do things because it works. We do things because we are obeying him. We, we, we're being led by him. And this last little expression, last verse, has become very dear to me over the years. If a son, verse 11 to 13, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, there's again that, that uh, correspondence with a child and a father, will he give him a stone? 
What kind of a cruel human being would you be if your child's hungry and instead of giving him bread that you have, you gave him a rock to chew on? You'd say, take the children off of that man. That's what you'd say. Or if he asked for a fish, you're going to give him a serpent, a snake to bite, to hurt his child? Now here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is well, he's showing us some things. He's not withholding what you need. Sometimes we think that. When we pray, we think, God, I need this. Why don't you give it? Look, if you're asking for something that you need, he's not going to give you a stone if you need bread for your belly. And he's not going to give you something that hurts you. God, why are you letting this happen to me? This is causing such trouble and such pain. No, no, he's not going to give you a snake to bite you. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more, much more. You ought to circle those words, underline those words, much more. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, what a promise. Because much of what we need can be found in the fullness of God's Spirit and in the leading of God's Spirit. Much of what we need in life, be, beyond material things, beyond bread for our bellies and, and beyond, uh, beyond healing for, for physical diseases, much of what we need can be found in the leading, guiding, filling of the Spirit of God. But well, most of us don't ask. We don't ask. Do you know you cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit? You cannot. It is impossible. And the majority of people who call themselves Christians today are trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. And I know that because they never mention the Spirit of God. They never, never talk to the Spirit of God. They never acknowledge the Spirit of God. It's what we can do with our own hands and our own intellect. And we talk about God the Father and Jesus, but we're afraid to mention the Holy Spirit. Shame on us. You can't even live the Christian life without Him. You can't be born again without the Spirit of God. Do you think the Spirit of God just birthed you into the Christian life and then left you hanging? Jesus said, I go so I can send unto you the Comforter. We have now the ability, the opportunity to do more than the disciples ever could do because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Do you know that? What an opportunity. What an opportunity. But we don't expect it, do we? We don't expect it. I'm going to close with one verse. Interesting, I was thinking about this. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he, he says something interesting in verse number 14. I write not these things. He, 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with a church that's got a lot of problems. He's correcting them and trying to sort them out. He speaks very authoritatively like a father. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Now, Paul is writing as a spiritual father to spiritual children. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. I love this. You can only have one earthly father, biologically speaking. It's the only way it works. You have one heavenly father. And Paul, trying to help his church, says, look, there's, there's going to be 10,000 people that want to teach you. They want to teach you a better way, and they're going to instruct you in this way. And not all that's bad, but not every instructor has an invested interest in your soul. Some people just want to be heard. Some people just want a follow, following. And Paul said, he says it in many other passages, Galatians 4, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 Timothy 1, Philemon verse 10. He speaks about how he birthed them. One of the signs you could say of a, of a true prophet versus a false prophet is the, is the fruit. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. And there are many people who want to be great teachers and lecturers and, and they have no fruit. They have no fruit. The evidence there is the fruit, those who have been brought through by the grace of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, 
You follow me then. Later, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, I'm, on, I'm throwing a warning at the end here, just adding to what I preached last. There are a lot of people who want to instruct you. You follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You follow the Savior. Follow him. There may be 10,000 teachers, that's what he says, 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Some of you today have never been born again. You need to be. You need to be born again. You need to know this heavenly Father. You need to know his love and his mercy and his grace. You need him. Would today that you would come to Christ. That you would turn from your sins and run to the one who gave his life for us. Christian, let me encourage you. Our God is a good God. Don't ever doubt that. Spurgeon once said that he's too good to be unkind. Too good to be unkind. Never forget that. And have an expectation. He wants us to expect great things from him. So may he give us great faith. Let's pray together, then we'll sing our final hymn here. Father, we thank thee that if thou wert be willing to give thine own son, how much more shall thy freely give unto us all things? Help us to believe, Lord, that thou art a good God. Oh, forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have misunderstood, misrepresented. Help us, we pray. We rejoice that we have not been dealt with according to our sins. We give thanks, Lord, that we are not what we used to be, that in love and in mercy, when we were totally opposed to thee, when we were so ungodly, when we were enemies, in love, you sought us and bought us. Oh, we thank thee, Lord. Help us to share this message of this great God. Help us to share this message. Lord, I, I pray for those who grew up with earthly fathers who did not show love, did not show compassion and pity and mercy, who did not nourish. I pray that they would not, as a consequence of that, that they would not misunderstand Thee, Lord, and that they would also not bear that same image to their own children. Help us, Father, to be like thee, as thou hast been to us. Help us to be to our children. Teach us this, we pray. Lord, we need thy help. We confess. As the disciples once prayed for help, we pray. Lord, teach us. Teach us to pray. Teach us to be good fathers, good mothers. Teach us, we pray. For we ask it in Christ Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.